Okay, hello YouTube. Today we're going to be going over the Petrov's defense, beginning with e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6. This begins the uh, so-called Petrov's or the Russians game. Now there are a lot of options here, but we're not going to be going over all of them. We're going to be covering the mainline martial variation, which begins after knight takes e5, d6, knight f7, uh, knight takes e4, d4, d5, uh, bishop d3, and then the martial begins with the smooth bishop to d6. So if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, please hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. Now the martial variation is by far and away the move that amateur players face the most often. I would say like between the 1200 level to about the 2000 level, you're going to see this variation 90% of the time. Uh, the move bishop to d6 is just the most natural move uh, for most players, uh, just between that rating range. It develops the bishop in the most natural way to the most natural square. And of course, we need to know how to play the position from here. So the main idea that white has in these positions is he wants to undermine the knight on e4. So basically what he's saying is that your knight on e4 is poorly placed and I want to force it to move back at some point. And the way that white needs to do that is he needs to do that by attacking the base of the pawn chain to try to make the knight kind of rethink uh, its position on the e4 square. But it's actually very important that we don't start undermining that post immediately. Like, we don't want to play c4 right away. We actually want to castle kingside in almost all these lines right away. And there's two really good reasons for that. One is we'd like to get our rook involved in the attack, so we'd like to castle and get our rook to e1 to help undermine that knight. And then, of course, the other reason is that if we play c4 a little bit too early, especially like in the Showalter variation with knight c6, c4, uh, bishop b4 check becomes a possibility. And that possibility is just very, very annoying. So we'd like to just castle. So we're going to castle here, and then black almost universally castles here, and then we're going to play c4. And we're going to start undermining this post. Now, of course, if black retreats, if black plays knight f6, this is yay, success, we made black retreat. He's basically playing some sort of closed variation, but he's down some tempos, and we've got more space, and this is just slight edge white, and life is good. So black is going to try to kind of hold this outpost somehow. Now, one thing that I've seen in a lot of scholastic games, and it's really dubious, is they will try to hold this post by playing the smooth pawn to f5. And of course, you can't do this with the pawn hanging on the d5 square. So, I mean, the, the simplest is just c takes d5, and then say something like knight d7, knight c3, uh, knight on d to f6, just really trying to prove that you can hold that um, e4 square. We can play something like queen b3, just holding our extra pawn on d5, a6, rook e1, uh, knight g4. Uh, this actually all got played one time. This was played uh, Quinteros versus Bartina, played back in 1974. Um, and it was a huge decisive advantage for white. White actually continued um, uh, knight takes e4 in that game and eventually went on to win. Uh, white has a huge advantage here. But he would have had an even bigger advantage with bishop takes e4, pawn takes e4, bishop g5, queen d7, knight takes e4. Just would have been huge decisive advantage. White uh, White's up uh, two pawns in this position, and more importantly, his he's got a great attacking position with just excellent chances to end the game in the next couple moves. So essentially, early f5s are kind of uh, questionable, to say the least. So the main move here is going to be something like c6. Uh, bishop f5 runs into the same problem, cd5, decisive advantage white. Uh, so we're going to have uh, c6 be our main move, and now we have two moves that we do get to kind of pick from here. We get to either pick c captures d5 or knight c3. So knight c3 is supposed to be slight edge white, like we can play knight c3, and it kind of forces knight c3, b c3, d c4, bishop c4, and this position is just supposed to be uh, slight advantage white. Um, a good stem game to kind of figure out what's going on from there is there was a recent game played between uh, Napomniche and uh, Karyana uh, that was played on chess 24 back in 2021 uh, that Napomniche Pomniche actually went on to win. Uh, you know, that main line kind of ran bishop g4, h3, bishop h5, g4, bishop g6, knight e5. Uh, these positions should just be considered slight edge white. And so you can just sort of play chess from here. This is a perfectly acceptable way to play chess. Another way that you can play this position is you can play c takes d5, c takes d5, knight c3. Uh, this is uh, kind of the, I would say, just like the old main line. So like knight c3, and then they play knight c3, and then you play bishop c3, b c3, and now they play the move bishop to g4, and you play rook b1. So the main idea behind this move rook b1 was this eventual exchange sack, which of course we now know is is probably just very good for white. Uh, this eventual exchange sack is, is a very good idea for white. It's also important to note that there is this thing going on on when to play h3 and when not to play h3. And it's actually a very important thing that you need to know if you're playing against the martial variation, and you're getting here and you're getting to the main line. When to play h3 versus when not to play h3. 
So the main thing is you want to be able, like say after a move like b6, you want to be able to threaten to capture the pawn on d5 if you play the move rook b5. Now the only way you're threatening to take this pawn is if this bishop is hanging out on the g4 square because there's this very neat tactical nuance here. So basically it looks like you can't take the pawn right now. Like it looks like you can't play rook takes d5. Like what if they just play a6 and say I dare you to take this pawn because hey I've got this discovery and if you play bishop takes h2 I'm taking your rook. Well in this case you're doing really really good and the point is is the bishop is on g4 and that makes all the difference. So if rook takes d5 bishop h2 you're going to play knight takes h2 and now when the queen takes d5 the queen is not defending the bishop on g4 because the queen correlates with the h5 square and not the g4 square. So if they play queen d5, you can simply play knight or queen takes g4 with decisive advantage. And even after bishop d1, you have rook d8, rook d8, rook d1, and you have two pieces for the rook, which should also be decisive advantage white. Now, taking this into account, if after, say, b6, you had preempted everything instead of rook b5, like let's say you had instead played this move pawn to h3 first, and then they had moved this bishop back to h5, and then you had played rook b5 hitting this same exact pawn. Now you are not threatening to take that pawn. So now after a6, you cannot play rook takes d5, because now after bishop h2, knight h2, same line, we're going to play queen d5, and now this queen is defending this bishop, and white basically has no advantage to speak of. Uh, apparently white's supposed to still be maybe somewhat, the position's supposed to be a little interesting after knight g4, but there, there, there's no advantage here. White's not doing... Uh, incredibly well here. So it's very important that you leave the bishop on g4 if you're going to play rook b5. So we get this rook b5 line and now the main kind of sacrificial continuation here uh, goes bishop c7 because they have to make this move to defend this pawn on d5 because again we are threatening it because the bishop is placed on g4. So now we're going to play pawn to h3. Now we can get away with it. So pawn to h3, now they're going to play pawn to a6 to hit that rook while we can't take the pawn because the queen is simply defending it. And this is where we sacrifice the exchange on b5. We're going to play h takes g4, takes on b4, and then we're going to play queen c2, hitting the pawn on h7. Now it is considered uh, uh, bad to play the move pawn to h6 and further weaken your light squares. And that's why just about everybody was playing this move pawn to g6. And in this game, Ivanchuk versus Bereave, Ivanchuk just absolutely crushed Bereave. Uh, Ivanchuk continued with bishop takes b5, queen d6, g3. These are supposed to be kind of the main attacking ideas. Rook a7, rook e1, uh, knight d7, g5. And this is the main idea, rook d8, a4. Just an exchange down, but holding everything together. Black basically has no play here. All of black's pieces are stuck behind his pawns. And then knight b8, knight h2, queen f8, knight to g4. And already this position is just incredibly decisive for white. Uh, bishop d6, king g2, just preparing to get the rook over to the h5, but also just preparing knight f6 and everything else. King h8, rook h1, queen g7, knight f6, h5, queen d1, and black resigned. Uh, there is just absolutely no preventing this attack from smashing through and just black having to resign. The main threat is just rook h5, g h5, queen h5, uh, or even I think the cutesy, uh, you know, uh, well, Queen h5 is a touch much because they can still throw the queen in the way with queen h6, but it's actually very close to to also winning. Uh, so either one of these moves, but basically the threat is just rook h5, like rook h5, g h5, queen h5 with just this decisive winning attack uh, for, for white. Uh, so this exchange stack line is just supposed to be pretty good. There's not supposed to be a whole lot here uh, that, that black is supposed to have. This is just supposed to be advantage white. Uh, we played this line for years with the white pieces, and it was it was very, very good. And then people just started trying other stuff with black because black just kept getting, you know, uh, getting crushed in all these different crushing attacks. Uh, so what else can we try here? Well, the main alternative try is going to be this move knight d7, which is basically just saying take the pawn on b7, I dare you, because if you do take this pawn on b7, I'm going to trap your rook uh, with knight to b6. Now, this gets kind of interesting because knight rook takes b7, knight b6 might actually be possible. Uh, you might be able to do this with white. Uh, this move, bishop g5, is super entertaining, especially if they play this move, this question mark move, if they play f6. Now, it, it's important to keep in mind that the move is completely tactically justified. So, like, if bishop takes f3, bishop d8, bishop takes, and we go through this cascade of exchanges, we're actually ending up on top here, whites up a pawn in this position, and should have some sort of major advantage. 
Uh, so we are tactically justified in doing this. Also on queen takes g5, bishop h7, king back. If king takes h7, knight takes queen, check is winning a whole queen. Uh, so king h8, knight takes, takes, takes. And there's no good way to trap one of these two pieces. So if, for example, f6 trying to trap it, so like f6, knight e6, king h7, rook takes, takes, rook d3 is going to be mating with rook h3. So... <laughs> The other way you can try to trap it is with g6, but again, we're going to have knight f7 check, and if king h7, king h7, we have knight d6 check with decisive advantage for white, decisive material lead, getting our piece back, plus we're still a bunch of pawns. And of course, if rook f7, rook takes, and the rook defends the bishop, and again, decisive advantage white, uh, we're just up in exchange and a couple of pawns for no reason. So it's completely tactically justified. Uh, the cute thing that can happen here is if they play this move pawn to f6 this move bishop h6 is adorable because if they take it we're winning with this move knight to e5 the whole point being is the bishop on g4 is hanging and if they take our queen we have bishop h7 king h8 knight g6 mate which is really awesome but there is a problem with this whole line which means that we probably shouldn't try it again with this move order and again this comes back to the whole thing with the petrovs there is this really important nuance that you need to learn about that goes on whether or not you should play h3 and whether or not you want this bishop on the g4 square or the h5 square because in this line uh there is this possibility that they can play queen c8 and if they play queen c8 and you defend with the logical move uh bishop to a6 they can simply play queen c3 now you're supposed to just be slightly worse if you continue with something bishop e7 but basically white's worse in this position why would you have a position in your theoretical preparation where you're slightly worse? I mean, after bishop e7, this is just supposed to be slight edge black. Uh, so the the move that you want to play is something like queen b3. And then after queen b3, uh, a b3, if they were to play, like, say, bishop takes f3, g takes f3, you would still be doing okay in this position. But they have this other possibility. They can play this move bishop c8, which just completely wins on the spot. Uh, they're just winning a whole exchange and you're dead. So this comes back to, do I want that bishop on g4 or do I want that bishop on h5 when I start all of this? Because what's interesting is the sacrificial, cool, snazzy tactical ideas still work with the bishop on h5. So basically, if you're going to play rook takes b7, you should start with h3. So h3, bishop h5, and now rook takes b7 is very reasonable. Of course, you can also play the old main line here, just this rook b5 move, uh, which is the move that Kasparov favored. Uh, there was a great game, Kasparov versus Sherov, Linares in 2000, that continued knight b6, uh, c4, uh, bishop f3, queen f3, dc4, bishop c2. And of course, Kasparov has a perfectly reasonable position here with black, and he eventually went on to win. I mean, with white, and he eventually went on to win against Sherov and Linares in uh, 2000. So this is another very reasonable way to play. But once that bishop is on h5, rook b7 suddenly becomes sound. So the whole point is, after knight b6, we can continue with bishop g5, although there are a lot of strong players that have tried queen c2 here, so apparently queen c2 is also a very reasonable way to play this. Uh, so uh, for queen c2, uh, there's a very good game uh, that happened between Purin and Kuzmic, uh, played in 2019, that ended in a win for Purin. So that was actually a pretty good game. That was played in Poland in 2019, uh, starting with queen c2. But there's this possibility. Bishop g5 actually works. So the main point is, is after queen c8, which is the move that refuted the other bishop g5 move, now bishop a6 works because there's not going to be a bishop c8 at the end of everything. So queen c3, queen b3 is perfectly fine. Queen b3, a b3. And there's no, the bishop can't go from g4 to c8 because it's on h5. So the only real move they would have is bishop takes f3, g f3, f6, bishop d2 is advantage white. White has two bishops and he has a rook on the seventh and the pawns are the same number of pawns. So this position should just be considered slight edge white. Uh, maybe not much more than that, but certainly slight edge white. So this position is certainly worth uh, trying. And it's interesting to note that the same cool uh, kind of tactical trickery um, exists within this position. Uh, starting with this move f6, you can still play bishop h6. And the idea here is after gh6, you play bishop h7, king h8, and now the move knight h4 is the decisive idea. Um, but it still essentially works. Uh, basically, the idea now is, of course, if bishop d1, knight g6 is still mate, and I'm still threatening queen h5, and I'm threatening um, everything else, but knight h4 is supposed to be decisive advantage white, so essentially the same trap will work with the bishop either on g4 or h5, but we want the bishop on h5 to prevent this move uh, queen c8 with all these trades, with eventually the bishop coming back to the c8 square. So all that stuff is a little complicated. 
Uh, but that's basically your overview on how to play against the Marshall variation. I really do recommend playing this old um, exchange sack line uh, with white, and I even recommend uh, snapping this pawn uh, on the b7 square and then going for this very much lesser played bishop to g5 move, which should lead to anywhere between slight edge white to major to decisive advantage white if black falls for some of the traps that are existing uh, within this position. So anyways, that's your overview on how to play the uh, how to play against the martial uh, variation of the Petrovs. Uh, I hope you found this uh, video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess and I hope you can use some of these ideas in your own games. Thank you very much for watching.